uh, participants in this panel are the world we want are Vangala Jaya Ram from India, Gerhard Kasper from Germany, Peter Hudson from the United Kingdom, and Johnny Antelone from the Philippines. The first voice you hear will be that of Vangala Ram from India. Ram, will you open the discussion for us? We want a world in which people can live as neighbors, friendly neighbors preferably, but peaceful neighbors at least. Meeting here in the Assembly Hall of the United Nations, we are especially aware and we regret that our forum group does not include students from Soviet Russia. Neither, of course, does it include American students. You have been so kind to us here that the only real moment of strangeness that I can recall was during a conversation about world politics. The participants seem to assume that the only powers worth considering in today's world are the USA and the USSR. The 32 of us come from 32 countries that bear allegiance neither to America nor to Russia. Yet our people share with your people and with the Russian people the hope that war can be avoided. Maybe some of our lands or leaders, maybe even some of us, could help to build a bridge of understanding. That is why we find so precious this chance to lay before you our viewpoints on some of the problems that are troubling us all. By the way, Ram, I assume that when you speak of some countries serving as the bridge of understanding, I assume thereby that you are defending India's policy of neutrality? Johnny, I was not thinking of India in particular, but now that you have brought it out, I might as well defend her role. The events of the past few years have made it fairly obvious that India is particularly suited for such a role. For instance, in the case of the custodianship of the prisoners of war in Korea, India has also amply demonstrated her neutral character, her independent judgment. In fact, what is neutrality? It is synonymous with independence. Oh, I disagree with you, Ron. History shows that neutrality is synonymous with dependence. If the United States hadn't been so neutral before the outbreak of the last World War, she might have gone a long way towards avoiding it. Instead, America's future became dependent on the outcome of the war in Europe, so she was forced to take sides. Peter, the very example you select refutes your own point. It is the neutrality of America since her independence and throughout her youth which has brought her to the position which she is in today. But today she's not neutral. But she is strong. Oh, but today the neutral countries aren't the strong countries. They use neutrality to justify their weakness, either because they don't want to be strong or because they're too small to be strong. And there's a third reason. Neutral countries today are neutral because they think that by being neutral today, they will be strong enough tomorrow not to be neutral anymore. <laughs> you see, the big problem in Germany today is whether we should be neutral. When the war ended, we heard always the same thing. A German army is the greatest danger to the peace of the world. We heard it on the wireless, we read it in the newspapers, and every foreigner we talked to said it. Today, we hear just the opposite. Today, the West says the European defense community needs German soldiers. But France doesn't agree. Well, France, of course, has some reasons for her feelings about Germany. Well, Peter, I found the same strong feeling against Germany in the United States, sometimes so strong that I hated to be the German delegate. People always say the Germans haven't changed. Especially the German young people have changed. Sometimes it seems to me that in Germany, more young people than in the United States are recognizing that life is not only to drive a car and to play basketball. There's one simple reason for it. We had to see too much of war in our own country. So we are forced to recognize that we must look for the real basis of our life. Because sometimes it might be too late and we cannot wait for the adults who come and offer us something to choose. It was too late for us in Germany in 1933. So today we ourselves must look for the basis on which we can live. You see, when the war ended, we uh, saw that people all over the world hated us because we have been nationalists. So we know that neither war nor nationalism is the answer 
the solution to get better relations to other countries. And Germany needs these better relations. Well, Britain too has had her post-war problems of relations with other countries, but they're of a different sort. You see, we must keep a common basis of understanding with the United States. This means that realizing that each country is important to the other. You see, the very fact that the United States wasn't even discovered when we were already a world power, that makes it difficult for us to realize that America is ahead of us. Have you forgotten, Peter, that India was a world power when Englishmen were still living in caves? We hadn't discovered you then. <laughs> well, as I was saying, there are other causes of misunderstanding. You see, the American quick-fire commercial tactics, in our opinion, they're not applicable to world politics. And you become patient with us because we don't use the same tactics. Nor do you always recognize the difference in our two temperaments. Whereas the United States sees, sees things in black and white, Britain sees the shades in between those two colors. You would solve any problem with a, a stroke of a pen, just like that, whereas Britain prefers to let time take a hand in the problem. There's another source of misunderstanding, and that's the inability of quite a lot of Americans to differentiate between communism and socialism. And that makes it difficult for me because I come from a welfare state. Then Britain accepts the fact of your power politically, but not emotionally. When we laugh at your overstatement, at your accents, at your witch hunting, it's only because we need some form of psychological uplift. You see, by laughing at you, we delude ourselves into thinking that we're your equals in power. Filipinos neither laugh nor smile at you Americans. However, because of America's role in the Philippines, I speak as a nation who trusts your motives. And I regret that not all Asians think as we do. However, they have a valid reason for it. And this is it. In trying to be friendly, you become aggressively friendly. And you ram your aid down our throats. And you tell us that you know better than we do how your aid should be used. That's right. The point for aid is an example. No doubt, it is a genuine expression of the desire of America to help an economically backward country. It has helped us very much. It is also good because we have to put up matching funds ourselves. And it is therefore a truly cooperative effort. But while the principle you start off with is cooperation, it sometimes degenerates into control. For instance, you do not allow point for money to be used for capital goods, even though we should want it, even though it should be desirable for us. That makes us wonder sometimes whether America wants us to be perpetual customers of theirs and not producers ourselves. Now, just a minute. Let us not generalize, Ram. That is not true in the rest of Asia. The America has set up producers' industries in the Philippines Indonesia, in Burma, and in many parts of Europe as well. Hasn't she, Gerhard? I think you are right, Johnny. She helped us in Germany to build up all our industry. But even more important, the United States is working with us to get a European Union. England, on the other hand, says that she's in favor of it, but doesn't want to be involved. Now, Britain favors a European Union, but not at the cost of her Commonwealth strength. <coughs> She hasn't joined herself because a European government would necessarily have more French, German, Italian, and other continental representatives than British. The result would be that British policy would be dictated by a distinctly non-British government. I should like to ask Graham this. If Germany and uh, France can uh, solve the South problem by Europeanizing <coughs> it, could India and Pakistan find a similar solution to the problem of Kashmir? It's very sweet of you to suggest it. But my answer to your question is a straight and simple no. Anyway, the suggestion is irrelevant. Europe already has the basis of a political organization. Asia does not. I wonder why not. Do we Europeans have more in common than Asian peoples do? The Europeans, through their imperial policy of divide and rule, have done their best to make us forget what we had in common. But now we have got rid of them. The very fact of a common colonial background gives to us Asians much in common. We are all backward economically and industrially, weak militarily. We share a common philosophy of non-violence. And most of all, we share a common enthusiasm for our freedom. And we all feel that at this young stage of our independence, to enter into a world struggle would be to lose the freedom it took us so long to get. 
be very interesting to know what you think about the admission of China into the United Nations. I know that uh, Chen Tai Kim, the delegate from Korea, says a very definite no. I disagree completely. It is inconceivable to think of the United Nations without China. A world organization that ignores a block of 400 million people is not representative. And without China, there is a danger that the UN may degenerate into an AAS. By that I mean an association of American satellites. If Russia is in the United Nations, I wonder why not China? The Soviet Union is there and therefore China can also. In, moreover, the admission of China would lessen the danger of war. For then, she could take part with us in the peaceful alternatives to war, which are discussion, mediation, and arbitration. I disagree with both Ram and Kim in part. I do not believe that we should deprive ourselves of a bargaining point, and therefore I feel that China should not be admitted into the United Nations unconditionally. If she must be admitted, let us get something in exchange, like unification in Korea and the promise there of an election under UN auspices. Well, uh, the Korean delegate says that free elections in Korea wouldn't be possible. Anyway, he says that the admission of China to the United Nations would be immoral. I admit its immorality, but this is no time now to discuss and split infinitives and discuss the fine hairs of philosophy. We must be realistic and face facts, and we in, Ra in Asia must look to the future. Now it comes to me that I find it strange that, what's, that you Americans think that most Asians are bound to the past. In a sense, I suppose we are. But what I admit that what struck me most about you Americans was that you discuss the future as if you think there will be one. I appreciate this especially since I come from a generation in the Philippines that is working for the future. We are one of the few countries in Asia with a young leader. Under President Magsaysay's policies, we have no past to bind us. You know how we solve the communist problem in the Philippines? By turning communists into capitalists. By giving communist people schools and land which they could call their own. That is proof, I think, that new leaders can find new solutions to old problems. Prime Minister Nehru may not be young in years, but India as a nation is young and full of vigor. Since our independence in 1947, we have drawn up a constitution by which India becomes the largest democracy in the world. And though we have 75% illiteracy, in our general elections three years ago, a greater percentage went to vote than in America's highly literate and experienced democracy. And even our women play a more important role in the public life of India than in any other country. We have more women in our parliament, more women ambassadors and provincial governors, more women in our cabinet than in any other country. And even the President of the United Nations is an Indian woman. Well, uh, Ram, the only reason Britain stayed in India so long after she started wanting independence is that we doubted your ability to govern yourselves. And I admit, we got the shock of our lives when you did make a go of it in such a short time. Is it possible that you're making the same mistake in Africa? Well, it depends very much on which part of Africa you mean. If you mean West Africa, then possibly we are. And if uh, Kitty, as we call him, is a representative of the coming generation in the Gold Coast, well, I think we don't need to have any fears of letting them take their own government into their own hands. But, Ram, if you're talking about Kenya, I think if we walked out and left Kenya to the Mau Mau, there'd be a reign of terror. But an interracial council has been set up in Nairobi a few days ago in which an African holds a portfolio for the first time in any British East or Central African ter territory. Uh, Peter, I was thinking less of, of any particular area than of the general principle involved. In order that our suspicion of the West completely disappear, the last relics of colonialism in the world must disappear. As an addendum to that, I'd like to say that here in the United Nations, we have a trusteeship council which is charged with the duty of taking over colonial areas. This answers effectively the excuse of most colonial powers today, that the reason they are where they are is that the people they govern do not know how to govern themselves. Mm -hmm. I believe that by turning to the trusteeship council more and more, we can get more used to the idea of a world organization. But Johnny, it is hard to get used to the idea of world organization if you are not even allowed to be a member of it. In this group of 32 students from 32 countries, nine are not members of the UN. As far as my country, Germany, is concerned, 
while we are waiting to get membership in the United Nations, we are at least doing something to get a European community. I think these regional groupings are a step toward accustoming nations to the idea of internationalism. Two events which have taken place during the last three months have made me very optimistic about the future of world peace. The first is the suggestion of President Eisenhower made to the United Nations in December for an international control of atomic energy. Frankly, at first I doubted the sincerity of this suggestion. But my visit to the United Nations on Tuesday last, along with other members of the forum group, has changed my belief. I am not only convinced of the absolute sincerity which prompted President Eisenhower to come out with that suggestion, but what is more, I am now certain that it is and can be the only lasting basis for world peace, and as such is inevitable. The second event of importance which took place a couple of weeks ago, was the recent Moscow statement that an atomic war means the end of civilization. Thus, for the first time, the Soviets have recognized that a war means not only the destruction of capitalism, but of the entire world. This mutual recognition from both sides that a war means the annihilation of civilization is very significant. It has to be recognized that the United Nations today represents the hope of mankind. It is a concrete translation of man's desire for peace. In that sense, it is a culmination of historical experience and the logical outcome of man's sublimest efforts. If nothing else, it affords a common platform where people of divergent views can sit together and talk over their differences. And isn't that a better alternative to war? No doubt, the United Nations is not perfect. For instance, I feel that if the following amendments to it are made, it could become a more effective agency. One, if all federations and blocs within the United Nations are dissolved. Two, if the veto power is abolished. Three, if all independent nations are made full and equal members of the United Nations through their real governments and not through imaginary ones. Four, if there is representation on the basis of population, this of course would mean that the white people would be greatly outnumbered, a fact which has to be faced sooner or later. Asia has now a more important and decisive role than the power blocks want her to have. This is the time that the Asian nations must combine by having a common policy of independence in world affairs. No Asian nation must allow herself to become a satellite either of America or of Russia. No one but Asia, through a joint endeavor, can avoid a world war. By aligning themselves with one of the power blocks, an Asian nation risks her independence. And such an alignment also represents an explicit expression of a desire to fight. But that is not what the people of Asia want now. They are young and need to develop themselves economically to a full stature and not engage in a world struggle. If possible, Asia will do her best to avoid a world war. If not, she will try to keep out of it. The conflict today is not between communism and capitalism, or between totalitarianism and democracy, or between freedom and slavery. The conflict really is between the haves and the have-nots, between the few who have plenty to eat, who live in good homes, who are educated, who have medical facilities, and between those millions and millions of people in Asia and elsewhere who do not have enough to eat, who are unemployed, who sleep on road pavements, who are denied the chance of going to school, and who have no means to defend themselves against disease. And much of this due to hundreds of years of colonial domination. This maladjustment of human relations cannot be the permanent and lasting basis of world peace. Well, I'm afraid I can't agree with all Ram said there, but I'll follow up his point about the haves and have-nots. It suggests a striking analogy. The position that the world's reached today was reached by Britain at the time of the Industrial Revolution. Then a few people got very rich, whilst the great majority worked under very poor conditions for very little money. And this gap between the rich and poor grew. 
Many economists believe that the gap must be maintained if the economy of the capitalist state was to survive. Well, Christians were heard at this and they began to help the poor. That was philanthropy. Then the fact had to be faced that this gap wasn't necessary to maintain economic stability. Then the government took a hand in it. The alleviation of the condition of the poor became the concern of the national government. An income tax was introduced to better the conditions of the poor. And to meet the cost, men with certain incomes contributed to the government towards that income tax. Now, to complete the analogy, the time has come for the rich countries of the world to face the fact that the gap between themselves and the underdeveloped countries isn't necessary to maintain world economic stability. They are realizing this to some extent, to the extent of point four and the Colombo plan. But these individual countries are just philanthropists. The United Nations here is the great hope, but at present they're relying on voluntary pledges from various countries. Now why can't wealthy countries do as they did within themselves when they reached a similar state of affairs? Why can't they be under United Nations auspices a form of international income tax where nations with an income over a certain amount can contribute, for example, two or three percent of their income in a form of tax payable to the United Nations? This tax would pay for development in Asia and Africa and the Middle East where the costs are too high to be borne by individual countries and any hope of a quick profit is very dim indeed. Development must be an effort of cooperation on behalf of the wealthy countries through the United Nations. Then no obligation will be felt by any small country towards any great single power and therefore there'll be no reluctance to accept aid. Like national income tax, it'll become both an act of self-interest and at the same time of justice. I like what Peter says. Income tax always ch touches me in a very tender spot. And when an Englishman speaks of paying out money, then things can be as bad as they seem. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, whenever I discuss with people the kind of world we want, they astonish me by describing a utopia without cares. They tell me of a world where a man can lounge around with a pipe in one hand and a book in the other. As for me, I like this world. I like the strivings and the plans of this particular century, for it makes me feel like being a part of a wonderful and exciting experiment. I marvel that not everyone realizes how fortunate he is to be, allow to be alive today. Here we are on the threshold of realizing a communion of nations. Here we are, favored spectators at the unveiling of some of nature's most precious secrets, and we are closer to the stars than we have ever been. However much I like this world, I still believe there is one thing it can do without, war. Perhaps my reasons are selfishly personal. Perhaps I exaggerate the, in the impact of war, but I survived one war and I know how it feels. I know what it is to be afraid of nothing and yet everything. I know what it is to crouch in a shelter's corner not knowing if the next bomb would be my own. I admit that war has given us many times the necessary push to do many things that might not have been done otherwise. But still I hate war for its general uselessness. I hate it because every time we have one, we rob ourselves of time which we could have used in building and not destroying. If I had lived before the A and H bombs, I might be less optimistic of the future. But I feel that we shall enjoy peace because I believe and I feel deeply that no nation shall start a war which none can possibly survive. With the weapons now in our hands and if we start another world war, there can be no distinction between loser and victor. I do not want a future which we, shall, which we are sure of shall be rosy because I believe that I like the suspense which gives to life its only true zest. If we must lose, I do not want to be disheartened in advance. And if we must win, I do not want to be bored by knowing so beforehand. I believe that if there is one thing we deserve, we deserve the pleasure of anticipation. I believe that this world we have deserves a vote of confidence. With its dirt and cleanness, its ups and downs, and its total unexpectedness, it is given to us through variety 
more pleasure than pain. This particular century deserves special credit. Whatever else it may be, it is still the broadest, the most exciting, and the most promising of all the centuries that have gone by. May this world always have its troubles except one. May it always be as challenging as it is. May it always have the scope and panoramic view that each one of us can have in it. May it always be, and may it never be, a place, a soft place, for soft people with soft heads. For I believe that we need the challenge, constant to bring out the nobility that is in each one of us. With such a world of such challenge and scope, our lives might never be complacent, but they shall certainly be worth living. Johnny says he likes the world as it is, a very interesting world full of problems which we can try to solve. I must say, there are students in Europe the same age as Johnny and me who don't think that way, because they are not free, because they aren't allowed to discuss and solve the problems we have. Until these problems are solved, we don't have a life that is worth living. In America too today, I think you have problems you should solve quickly. Many people in America don't see the danger that freedom is in today as well as somebody coming from the outside. You fear American communists, but you also should really fear people who try to save you from, commu from these communists. I'm told the last years of the Weimar Republic, Hitler got power because he frightened the people by the danger of communism. And the people followed him to be saved from communism. And while we were not seeing what we were looking at, he took our freedom away. I like the United States, a country of freedom and of problems, because your problems prove that you are free. And that is one of the most important facts I will take back with me to my country. As a summary of my forum experiences, I would like to say to you, the world we want is for me still the world of freedom, of peace, and of tolerance, of international understanding and equality of right. This doesn't depend in the first place on the politicians, but on the people like you and me. We will never get the world we want if there are people in Germany who hate the Jews or in the American people who hate the Germans. But we will get it if we first think about our own mistakes and then about the things other people have done wrong. Why do I believe in a future? Because it was possible for me, as a German, to be together with the Israel, Israeli delegate during Brotherhood Week in the United States, as a German who is together with a very good friend. As long as young people have this opportunity, we must believe in a future, because the day will come we young people will take over governments. This sounds optimistic, very idealistic, but I am sorry, I believe in it.